I stole from work to feed my cocaine habit. Yeah, and then she just punched me and I just took it. In the face? Mm. It was always in the face. All throughout this period, like from day one, I wanted to kill myself. Not used to your voice being heard and all of those type of things. You always feel like you're being judged. And I have, I've, I've, I've released that control now. No, I don't care what, unless you're in the arena, I don't care. How long did that take? I've started recording by the way, but just keep talking. A year. A year of posting. I've been posting for nine months, 10 months, but it's taken me a year to get over the fact that I would be seen if I went down this path. And who were you worried about the most? Everyone, to start off with, if I'm honest. It's, I suppose it's quite weird because I have been in the shadows for so long. Like to suddenly say, I'm coming out of the shadows, I've got a message, I wanna share it, I wanna tell it, I wanna tell my story. Hopefully it helps or lands with someone. To suddenly go from that to go like being really, really in the shadows, like avoiding everyone, to suddenly, hey, I'm here. Fucking scary. Yeah. That's scary. So I felt like even telling around those types of sub, talking around the subjects that I do, that a lot of people would judge me. Family, like I was really worried about what my mum would think. Bless her. She cried at first when I started talking about my mental health online she said I don't think you should talk about it online okay I think this is this is how I wanted to start the podcast and I think this is so interesting right because I wanted to start with saying how this conversation came about and okay so I so your is it your little brother's friend is Luke. Luke, yep. Who has been coming to my flat to help <laughs> deal with these fucking squirrels who... <laughs> and we can't get rid of them. Anyway, but he came and someone was at the flat, at my flat, who had told me that when I published my first episode of this, I talked about my brother ending his life and how I wanted to make something that he could hear that would show him that humans can overcome things and make you know make him feel okay with whatever he was going through and to then anyone else who's struggling to, with whatever it doesn't have to be as intense as like suicidal thoughts or depression or it could be just yeah a breakup or like a job loss or to just hear other humans say like yeah this terrible thing happened because everyone goes through difficult stuff anyway so he the per this other person had said to me like I don't think you should speak about what he said to me like you don't need to speak about your brother in a way that was like I felt like he was saying it's wrong to talk about suicide Mm. or something like I just felt so uncomfortable by it but anyway so when Luke came over for the first time I didn't know this person was overhearing this conversation and Luke somehow I don't know how I started talking about somehow he ended up talking about depression and suicide within the first like two minutes and he was like oh I have a mate who tried to kill himself and he talks about it <laughs> and was like and then he, and he was just like oh have you tried to kill yourself and he and then was just having but like he's such a lovely guy like yeah. it's it just this he was so and I actually appreciate how like direct because he was like there's no shame here or anything he was just like oh you (laughs) and then anyway i ended up he was like yeah let's look at his videos like he and then i ended up messaging you being like you should come on my podcast anyway and then i've just turned up here in which i had no idea (laughs) every time luke would come over to deal with the squirrels he'd be like oh have you gone and interviewed dan i'm like no i'll go i'm like yeah i'm gonna go down there and then, yeah, I had no idea how far away it was or anything. I was like, yeah, I'm going to head down on Friday. Yeah, what? It'll be like an hour. He's like, I think it's longer than that. Anyway, but I came down, have had an amazing day, 
when you sent me to that cafe this morning, I was like, great. This I will Very get good. along with this person based on... <laughs> My coffee taste. <laughs> your, yeah, taste in cafes. Beautiful day here. We're like sitting overlooking the ocean. Anyway, that's how this came about. But before we get into all of that, everything with your mum, which I'm really interested about, can we start with how you grew up? Yeah, um, I suppose I, c- I come from a, I've got, a, before we go, I've got the most amazing family. They're the most loving family and I'm, I'm very lucky. But I think I came from a very traditional home where the expectation was my parents are still together, my grandparents are still together. Both of my brothers have got long-term wives and children and, and stuff. But So I come from that very traditional outlook on family and family that definition of success is based upon having a wife a couple of kids mortgaged up to your eyeballs in a house in London that's the definition of success Um, so growing up we were always taught and I think You'll find the love of your life and then you don't have to ever worry. You're married before the age of 30. You'll have kids, you have two kids before the age of 30. And that that will be it. Your life will be amazing. You'll get a very secure mid-tier job in a big HR department uh, of a bank or uh, um, financial services. You'll be fine. That is success. So that was my, always my goal growing up. Is that what your dad's job was? Yeah, my dad's in fin- my dad was in finance. Um, so I suppose for me, I never... So growing up, I always thought, oh, I'll just go into a big corporate HR business. And I did... My childhood, other than that, was v- varied. When I was growing up, the first few years, so good, so free. But when I got into la- the latter years of primary school and I started... I suppose either male testosterone or um, kids started to get their hierarchy in terms of who's popular, who's not popular. That's when my life started to... I started to struggle. I struggled from as young as nine. I started suffering with anxiety at nine years old. Um, I was severely bullied in primary school. And then that phase of bullying didn't stop until I was probably age 23. Um, through through secondary school I was bullied and then even in my first job I didn't even realise until a lot of work with a therapist God bless her um, a few years ago was like basically she shed a light on the um, that I'd been suffering bullying in the workplace up until the age of 23 but I was so blinded by it I think I was so normalised to what bullying looked like or become so accustomed to it what kind of stuff was that? It was more like mental bullying. I, w- I would be talked about in such a bad light or I'd be slagged off in front of everyone. And then behind the scenes, I'd be told, I'm really like, go on, keep on doing what you're doing. And then I would be made a fool of in front of everyone. Um, and that was management. Um, and they messed up my head. Big time. Like, but I, I was subject to that from so young. I didn't really, I thought that was the norm. I've just thought that was the way of life. So yeah, I suppose up to nine years old, good upbringing. And then outside of my family. Yeah, um, very difficult. I found it very challenging. What was the bullying like at school? It it varied. It really varied. Um, To start off with, it was more mental in just terms of, name calling that type of stuff um from friends or I'm, I'm gonna say friends like I thought were friends and then the crowds I tried to fit in with um so I was constantly trying to fit in with whatever crowd was seen as popular but I was always I always weren't quite in the crowd. I was on like the outside in the in certainly in the outside in my younger years of the crowd, and they would sort of accept me, 
but then would make sure I knew my bloody place in that group, in the hierarchy of the group. When it got to secondary school, it really changed from... Well, I went to secondary school, I got into comprehensive school and um, that's comprehensive school that I was doing okay and shut down. What does comprehensive school mean? So we have like two tiers, like it's comprehensive and then you have grammar, which is like for more, in, what do they say, more intelligent people or have got higher grades. I actually got into grammar, but my dad actually said, bless him, thought he was protecting me, said, you've only just scraped into grammar, don't go to grammar because you'll be bottom and you won't like being bottom. So go to comprehensive and then you'll be at the higher end of the, who's doing well? That's probably worse to see. One of, another one of my uh, decisions that I probably shouldn't have listened to because um, I wanted to go to grammar. But I went to secondary. Oh, and was the grammar school where the Rolling Stones went or something? That for grammar. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was. Mick Jagger. Yeah, that was the school I wanted to go to. But my dad said, I think you might be bottom, so don't go. Like, it would damage your confidence. So, yeah, I went to this comprehensive secondary school and that closed down because um, they wanted to change it into an adult education centre, which I was quite settled in. But So it was an all-boys school. And we moved to a mixed school at 13. Um, and my life become a living hell. Like, I mean, a hell from day one. We were all these new boys. The hierarchy is already set in that new secondary school of who's the most popular, who's the fittest, who's the most athletic, who's the most popular. And I come down at the bottom of that pecking order. And there was and there was girls. This was my first exposure, really, to to girls when I've hit puberty. Um, and for men in for boys in that environment, it's like to um, <laughs> the love language they thought the love language of girls at that age was to show off how strong they were or show off how athletic they were so unfortunately because of my size at the time and everything I was the smallest so I got um, bullied severely from physical abuse um, to being punched, to being hit, to like being shamed in the showers, to everything in between, um, to having some of my schoolwork completely destroyed, to like literally having, um, I'm going to say it, this, there's a C word in English called cunt, um, to having that written on this big architectural project I'd done for graphic design, like everything was destroyed by these bullies from the age of 13, 16. And was it the same boys? Yeah, it seemed to... Whether they necessarily the same boys, there was like three different groups, but they become... As the years went on, they become closer as a group. And as that group started to become bigger, the bullying would increase. And I was just... Unfortunately, it was just... I always used to say to myself, I always used to think, oh, you must have that face that people just want to hit you or like, or just want to take the piss out of you or that type of thing. And I now know that that wasn't normal to what I um, was accustomed to receiving. But at the time, I wanted to fit in and I didn't want my mum and dad to know I was weak because I was the oldest of my three, well, I've got two other brothers that I was the oldest. I didn't want anyone to know how bad it was. So you didn't tell them? I didn't tell anyone. Did your friends know what was going on? Yeah, but they were just as petrified as me. Would they be targeted? No, not as severe. Um, I had two main friends and we were all quite good at sport, um, but them two were exceptional at football. It's because of they were gifted athletically, and I always had to try really hard at football. I did get to a good standard of football, but I had to try a lot harder 
to get there. They were already athletically gifted. And because of that, they were put into that hierarchy just above me in the food chain. And they so they didn't really get the abuse that I got. But could you talk to them about it? No. Um, Did you tell any, like, were teachers aware? I was, I was actually ashamed to be me. And because I was so ashamed of myself, I thought it was, I was doing something wrong. So I felt like, I felt like I, I, I don't know, it messed my head up so much. It felt like, I did, at the time, I started to, hmm, I thought I deserved to be bullied. Like, I don't know why. It was like, some, suddenly it was like, I knew I was being bullied. Oh, actually, you are fucking not worthy, Dan. So you need to fucking take this. Are you able to make sense of it now? Because I'm just thinking about my... On the first date with my ex-boyfriend, he told me... I'd asked him, like, what's the... You're, like, the worst thing you've ever done. I don't know what... Something. Mm. Oh, I can't remember what I asked him. Anyway, he just... The first time we met him, ended up telling me about how he had bullied kids at school and he was really ashamed of that. But he explained it. It was, like, in the boarding house and he was the one that was picked on by the older boys when he was young mm-hmm. he was like their target their punching bag I think because he was bigger actually so they felt it was okay to beat up someone much younger than them who was like the same size but then he then passed that on when he was older because he was like well now I'm going to do the same because it was done to me yeah, I, I definitely think there is some of that um, to... Because when I... I remember my... Um, I felt like when I was growing up, one of my greatest achievements between the age of 16 and 21 was I got into a crowd. I started to rebel at the age of 16 because I'd been bullied so badly. I didn't want, I was like throwing my toys out of the pram. I was causing my mum and dad absolute hell. Like I was not turning up in my sixth form or anything like that. And, um, you know, I was doing things very out of character. Um, I met a, a, a small group of guys that grew to be a big group of guys. Um, and one day down the park, we're all drinking our um, beer and white lightning, which is like a, a really cheap, shitty cider in this park. I'm only about 16 and a half. And this fight broke out between two people in the in this big group of boys. Anyway, because I was trying to fit in, um, I was like egging the fight on, egging the fight on. And and this young lad turned around to me and was like, well, if, you're, if you think you're so hard, mate, you fucking do it. And I turned around and punched him straight in the face and knocked him out. And I remember everyone celebrated me. Everyone celebrated that act. And I was like, and I look back at now and just like what you said, like the bullied becomes the bullier because it's like you've moved up the food chain. Now you're looking down on the food chain. This is like the transition into adulthood. Now you become the big guy and now you can bully the people below you. And it's, and it's weird um, how that's, in those hyper-masculine environments, how that's actually celebrated. It's either violence, um, athletic ability, how good looking are you, or how popular you are. That's what defines success. I was none of those things, but I started hitting out when I was 16 because I wanted to be seen as one of them things. So how did you feel then when you were celebrated for the punch? Um, honestly, good. It was a fe- it felt like I'd been accepted. I've been chasing acceptance from nine years old. Someone just to fucking like me, like. And at the time, I was like, "Oh my god!" Like, people think I'm cool now. And I, I look back. I'm like, this guy, this kid was not cool. This kid was lost. This kid just 
did not understand how the world worked. That can show him a load of empathy. Do I agree with that action? Absolutely not. But I understand how he got to that action and how that actually did feel good. And then did it make you want to keep doing that? Um, it brought me a free ticket for a long time, uh, especially in that group, because it was like... Was the guy okay? Yeah, yeah, he was okay. He's fine. We were friends after. Um, it was fine. I become... It gave me status for a short period of time. It gave me status and that I was accepted. So I didn't ever have to... That act of violence... I never had to uh, had to repeat again. I never had to bully anyone again. But it just because I acted in that way, people gave me respect, and that re- respect would last. They were like, felt like, oh, if we did get into trouble, Dan would know how to handle himself. So he's fine. He's one of us. And that was my sort of way in. It's, it's like an initiation. That's how it felt. And how did you? How else did you start acting out? Um, not turning up to school. Got kicked out of school just because of repeatedly not showing up, smoking weed down um, alleys at the side of school. It was just normal schoolboy behaviour. What was it like getting kicked out? I actually laughed. I didn't want to be there anymore. I hated school. I hated school so bad. And it wasn't actually the school's fault. It was because of my experience of school. So for me to get kicked out, again, was in a weird way, was like a success. And what was your parents' reaction? <laughs> my mum. Uh, my mum... I, I, I tell you what my dad was. My dad was... He was just very stern. He was in finance. He was like, okay, if you're not going to go to school anymore, you've got one one other option. Get yourself a job in a big corporate environment. Go and get an apprenticeship or something in a big corporate environment. That's your other choice. So I took that other choice. That's what I did. That was my only dad's advice. My mum was a little bit... I suppose she was upset that I had allowed myself to get kicked out. But also she was in agreement with my dad. Like, if you don't want to do that, go and do some work. That will do you good. So that's what I did. And you're happy to do that? It got to that point where then I didn't know what made me happy. I knew a career in finance or the corporate world was not for me. Like, it was not for me. But my parents have done all right in life. So if my parents have done all right in life, maybe that is the route to go. So I just... I suppose it was just uh, passing down of the baton. I'll just follow the footsteps. So you started working recruiting? No, I started working in banking. Um, and that would go on for seven years and I hated every single day of it. What were you doing? I started off as um, like customer service, like in retail. For which bank? Um, Barclays. <laughs> um, I worked- Like more... on the phone? No, no, in like retail shop, like- Oh, in a branch? Yeah. In then... London? Okay. Yeah, yeah, South East London. And then I went up to, like, I got up to a good level like, in, in, that, in that world. Um, but by the time I got to the good level in that world, a lot had gone on in my personal life, so I wasn't the same person who started that journey. So why did you hate it? Isn't it? It was just... I. Well, it just wasn't me. Like, it, everything was... It just wasn't me. I felt tight. I felt anxious. I felt... I felt like it was forced. It wasn't my career. It was... It was everyone else's but mine. But you were like, I'll just turn up and... I'll get the money. Get- yeah, get the money at the end of the month and then I can go and blow that on um, 
whatever that looked like, which I suppose at 18 looked like um, getting enough money to make sure you can go out Thursday, Friday and Saturday night. So what was going on in your personal life during that time? So this is where it got a little bit messy. So at 21, I met my... 20, sorry. I met my, what I would say, my first love or my first experience of what I thought was love. Um, that relationship was really bad. Really bad. It was toxic. Um, but I fell quite hard or I felt like I felt quite hard and because I'd been suffering from with anxiety from... Um, nine years old looking back now I realised I had a really anxious attachment style anyway like I would I'm, I was very needy at the time um, that relationship resulted into mental and physical violence um, me being on the receiving end of domestic violence because I had I think I alluded to at the beginning of this conversation that I had that definition of success to be too up too down there was also a belief that you never give up on your partner and I'd hidden I didn't know how to express emotion now now I'm totally bottled up I haven't told anyone about the bullying I haven't told anyone that I hate this job I'm now getting punched by my partner I could not tell anyone that how did it start do you know what I can't even remember I remember one incident which was in a nightclub in the West End of London, just off Leicester Square. It was called Ruby Blue or something. I don't know whether it's still there or not there. I don't know. Near like the Odeon Cinema. And me and my friends had gone to this with our partners and we'd all in there. My brother was with me with his other half and we was all in this nightclub and I was dancing like I normally do, quite tragically, um, probably doing a very stiff robot. And anyway, this sat this bouncer. No, I went outside for a, a cigarette. And as I went outside for a cigarette, the bouncer comes over to me and was like, um, "Sorry, sir, like I'm not going to let you back in. Like you're really drunk." Truthfully, to this day, I had two drinks at this time because I was skin, and there was about eight quid. Of drink in this place and I was like mate I've honestly I've only had like two drinks I can't even afford drink tonight like I'm just coming out because all my friends are out blah blah and he was like no mate I don't believe you he said there's a Burger King over there in the uh, in Leicester Square the big Burger King he said go over to the Burger King get double espresso come back over I'll let you back in anyway my miss my ex-partner comes down the stairs at this time and she was like what are you doing? And I was like, oh, they won't let me back in. I'm too drunk, apparently. Like, you know I've only had two drinks. And she did look to me like, like a very cold look. And anyway, I, I'd done this coffee. I come back in. I don't even know whether I got the coffee, to be honest with you. I think I just had to walk around the block. Uh, come back in, said I had my coffee. He's let me in, let me back in, got back upstairs. I've started dancing again. She's come over to me and just gone, just you fucking wait. Like, really, like, it was really cold. And I was like, what? Anyway, I'm now really anxious because I, I, really, I feel like I've really upset. I don't really know, understand what I've done. And um, we get out of Leicester Square. We get out of this club. We're walking down the road, and my brother and my friends are all in fr in front. We're walking to Charing Cross, and they're all walking in front. And we're on these railings and she just turned around and was like, I'm so fucking embarrassed of you. I was like, what? It's like, how can you be embarrassed of me? What? I was like, because of my dancing and laughed. And she went, you know fucking what? And then just smacked, like physically punched me in the middle of this road in front of my brother. In the face? In the face. And I was pissing with blood out of my mouth and I was, I was laying, I was literally sat next to, sat on these railings. I don't know whether I fell back knocked back or whatever but I was on these railings I had blood coming from my nose my lip and I was like 
what the fuck has just gone, like, what the hell has just gone on? And I was so embarrassed. But remember somehow the next morning I apologised. Did your brother see? My brother saw it. And again, my brother didn't know how to deal with this situation. Look, this is, we always talk never to touch a woman. And this woman has now just, like, assaulted me, who's my partner. What happened afterwards? Was she like, are Mm. you okay? All I can remember about the next day was... But, like, on the nut, like, how did you clean up your face? I I literally got tissues out of one of those, you know the toilets that you walk downstairs in London and you put 20p in the little thingy? I got tissues, just cleaned myself up, looked like I'd been... And where was she? Waiting for me. Like, nothing had happened. Like, just nothing. And then this... And you would have just been in shock? Yeah, I've... I didn't know how to... Pro- Do you know what? At the time, I just did not know how to process that act. But because I feel like I've been bullied for so long in work, in school, in life, like it wasn't as dramatic shock as you, I would have felt like it should be. Like, it felt like I've been here before like I know, I know what this is. It's like pain for tonight, and then after the anxiety subsides, you'll be all right the next morning, and you can come back out. So it's like I'd been accustomed to it. Okay, so you were maybe scared of her or something. Oh, I was definitely scared of her, and I was definitely not in a relationship that was at um, a level playing field because of my anxious attachment style and how I needed love. Okay, so she took advantage of that. Yeah. How did you meet her? For a friend of a friend. One of those conversations. And did you pursue her at the start? Yeah. Yeah. She was attractive and I was attracted to her. And I just, I I think because of bullying and because of my mum and dad's definition of success, like never give up on your relationship, I just become very submissive. How long into the relationship was it that this happened? Mm, Probably about six to nine months down the line. But the dynamic had already been established that you like really needed to hold on to this relationship. Yeah. And she could sense that. Yeah. Yeah, I had no, um, I had no power. No, I, I don't think you want power in a relationship. I had no. But yeah, you wanted to be an equal partnership. No, we weren't in an equal partnership. No. So had she been doing like, emotionally manipulative stuff to that point? There was a, there was there was an incident where I was so so ill, um, through a dodgy sausage and batter which I can never eat again. <laughs> I had such severe food poisoning from this sausage batter. I was up all night, like, vomiting blood, shitting blood, everything. It was so bad. I was... I've never been in pain Did you like, tell the fish and chips this, shop? Everyone said that. I was in hospital for four days from this fucking sausage and batter. Four days. You and have it, to tell them. Uh, uh, to stop uh, them poisoning other people. Yeah. I was only 21, I just wanted to get home. I was like, oh my God. Uh, this, yeah, she kept telling me through the night when I was, when I was, I was lying. That I was being dramatic. And you're in hospital. And then basically I had to go to hospital. My mum actually stormed in and was like, because she heard how bad I was. She's like, fucking hell, we need to get him into hospital. Like, there's actually blood here. And uh, I got put into hospital. Okay, so you were physically throwing up and you being told that you're being dramatic. Yeah. Hmm. So did your mum sense what was going on? <laughs> I love my mum to pieces. She is the most introverted, loving mother ever. 
my mum knew but didn't know how to deal with didn't know she knew something was going wrong in that relationship didn't know how to tell me or how to tackle it with me bless her and she's so just loving that she could never tell me Dan like what's going on like be really straight and um were you living at home at that point yeah yeah and my ex-partner would sometimes be with me and sometimes be in a like at her, at her place and it would only happen at this place because we had like quite a lot of room between other rooms so that things would go on behind our closed doors if that makes sense well, my mum knew, but my mum didn't. It wasn't too many years later. I remember being around my nans for a Sunday roast, and they, my mum as ne- I'd never heard my mum say bad about anyone. Like never say bad about anyone. She went. I can't remember what the conversation was. I just remember the line. She went. I won't run over anyone apart from your ex, Dan. <laughs> I was like, what the. Where the fuck is that come from? I've never seen her dad say anything like that in my life. But um, she, she knew. And could you sense ten- tension between your... Oh, it finished. Like, when it finished, everyone was relieved. They would not let me go anywhere near. But or, while, it, while it was going on... Was no one knew how to deal with it. But were they all friendly to her? Like, was she warm to your family? I suppose w- not warm. What is the right word? Just got on with it. Just made it bearable. But was she fake or would she act like aggressive to you in it front was, of them as well? It wouldn't ever be in front of anyone. But they didn't like how she would. So the way she would speak in front of people was very disinterested, like very distant, like don't really give a shit. But still with that smile, but not really there. You know, like when someone smiles, but actually no one's at home. It was that type of... And my... But I was so... I felt like I was so in love or I'd just been so abused that... I always told my family that, no, that you can't say bad things about her. That's like the person I'm going to be with. So what were the good things about her that made you feel in love? <laughs> I look back and for me, when I first met her, it was, she was a, she was a good looking girl. So I felt like, yay, I've got, I've got a good looking girl. Because um, I'm a 21 year old kid who's seen it in the movies and now wants it for himself. Like, And honestly, I can't remember much from like, what, how, what did I see? What did I actually see? I honestly can't remember. But you must have enjoyed spending time together. Got on. In the early stages, like I think any lustful relationship at the very, in the very like first six months, so you're doing all these nice things, it's all very new, like you're meeting each other's families, that t- it's all quite warm in that stage. It's that it was after the lustful stage sort of started to diminish. That's when things felt like it started to turn dark. But you felt like you needed her. So you yeah. put up with the yeah abuse, I, and I felt like I'd be a failure. Like I didn't, I didn't understand how I'd meet someone else because I already felt felt pressure. If I left her, uh, I le- we broke up when I was twenty three, but I already felt pressure that it was too late for me to meet someone. So you were like this is the girl I'm going to be with forever. That was it. Yeah. Like, I already felt like, because my, all my family had been, to, they had met from school. And I'm like, I'm the, la- I'm the last one. I'm under s- severe pressure here. What about your friends? Um, a lot of my friends, like, I'm st- still not married, still ain't got kids. Like, nothing. my best friend in the world, he's got like a 13 
year old boy and a 10 year old boy like so I've been accustomed to that way of life it all happened around me I just felt very pressured that I hadn't achieved it okay so you did see other people settling down at that point yeah and you're like I have to as well yeah so then how often was she abusing you after that first night um it wouldn't be like it would happen all the time but the the mental stuff like there was the way I was put down the way I was like I don't know what the terms are now like gaslighted like all of those stuff that happened as like a constant and the, the but the physical acts would be if things got really bad like if we had a row the reaction would be I would hit not me she would hit me okay so it wasn't even necessarily drunk and night no 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 I've I, I we was in my bedroom once and we, we was actually having a, like a normal I would say a normal row probably over some like cooking or fucking or yeah or what we were going to watch on Netflix or something like that and yeah it escalated and I remember I was actually felt really angry and I never really I felt really fiery and then um, yeah and then she just punched me and I just took it in the face mm. it was always in the face and would you bleed always um, I don't think every time but yeah I did have a few cuts and grazes mm. and then ha- would she apologise or what did you how did you explain the there would be I saw uh, I saw this person many years later and she actually wanted me she rang me out of the blue and actually said oh Dan you know what I'm like she was with a new partner um, I'm drunk and we've had a row and I've hit him and he's threatening to call the police and I, at that time I nearly said I would come and help I felt the urge to help. Help her. Yeah. Get out of it. Yeah. And help her get out of it. And then I didn't. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> mm, so she would play the victim, basically. Yeah. Would she get upset after she hurt you? Um. Or it was kind of like, look what you made me do. You know, crocodile tears. I felt like it was that sometimes. Like, and it was, yeah, she would play the victim. Oh, you know what I'm like, the background I've grown up in. Like, was she? The back. No. um, I don't really know the full dynamic, but parents weren't together. And I don't know, but never a history of abuse. Um, yeah I couldn't tell you why so how did it end she broke up with me bloody cheek of it Um, she broke up with me and I was crushed but also felt quite liberated. Like I was free. It was like freedom. But I was quite broken hearted at the same time. It was a wh- like that whole feeling. Um, yeah, it was weird. I felt liberated. I felt, I felt like I needed to be free. But I also was heartbroken at the same time. Why did she break up with you? She had gone to Ibiza. I knew I I found messages from other guys on like Facebook and stuff like that. And um, I suppose she was going to. What do you mean you found them? They were on her Facebook. I've got this really weird story. Publicly. My friend, so I've got a friend who I grew up with. He went to prison. Went to prison in Spain. For what? 
Um, he got involved in a drug ring, but he Coke. was, y- y- I don't know. And then they went to do a job on a bank in Spain. He was hired as the driver for the gang, so he wasn't actually part of the gang, but he was, and he got was going to get paid handsomely. And anyway, he got it all went wrong. The gang actually then blamed him and told him he was the leader of it, and he got sent. Were they Spanish? Yeah, Spanish. He um, was part Colombian, so he's part like Spanish. I know that's all the labels right there, but he he's actually he's part English, part Colombian. Anyway, he rings me from prison in Spain. I haven't spoke to him since he went to prison. He rings me from this prison in Spain and went, your girlfriend is cheating on you. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, I've got messages to prove it. I know she's cheating on you. So I'm like, this girl that I, is meant to be love of my life, my friend who's in prison in Spain is ringing me off one of those snide phones telling me she's cheating on me everyone else is telling me and I'm still like no it's definitely not true but it was true so yeah it was uh, that's why I felt liberated I felt like I wasn't going to be I had my freedom back but also it, it was the person that I pinned all these hopes and expectations on so you felt like a failure yeah and yeah it hurt whatever was left of my masculinity because it was quite low anyway whatever was left of it had now been completely and utterly diminished obliterated gone like I've I had a loss of pride did she go off with one of the guys she was, I don't know. I don't know. How was, did she do it? She was just like, I'm done yeah, it was just this. one day, and then um, like I remember, like a few weeks later, we spoke, and she was like, "If you wanted me that bad, you would have fought for me." At the time of the breakup, I was like, "I am so fucking confused here." A few weeks later. Yeah. So it was kind of like a game or something. Yeah, it was okay. like I, I was mean, so confused. This, woman obviously has issues to <laughs> to be I hope to, she wasn't a normal woman to be yeah I yeah. mean yeah. hopefully she has figured them out and it's not I'm sure I'm sure else. she has yeah. okay so when did you realise all of this was so not because so you just kind of kept this all yeah so I got I kept this and every time I got one of these lies on top of all the trauma I um, just hid them because I didn't want anyone to see me I just wanted to be accepted I want to be like I wanted to be popular and I come from that culture that you do not show emotion you show emotional control at all fucking times like you act strong like you bottle this shit up you suck it up Big boys don't cry. Get the fuck on with it. And that's no fault of my dad, my granddad. That's no fault of my friends. It was just beliefs passed on beliefs passed on beliefs. And they were just all installed in us not to open up. So after that finished, I started drinking heavily. And it was very prevalent. But cocaine got introduced on an evening out. Um... I took cocaine. I said no, because my mum had installed in me. Like, and I could always hear my mum's voice whenever I took cocaine. Like, don't ever do drugs. Like, don't do drugs. Like, like please don't hurt me. She would, say, she would say it would hurt her if I did drugs. Was weed fine or was that included in that? Look, weed. Because you were doing that uh, Weed, I stopped about 18 because I, I pulled a whitey and fell over and um, I was What's sick that? everywhere. It means, like, you're just go completely okay. white and was sick so I just gave that up that wasn't a weapon of choice definitely but you didn't feel like you were hurting her as much with that no because I I could justify it in my head that it was natural yeah. and it grew out of a plant pot but anyway cocaine anyway I got really drunk 
it's like one, two in the morning. I'm around this guy's house from work. And he was like, and all this white powder. I haven't seen cocaine yet. This cocaine f- comes from a plant as well, by the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, so it's just interesting because in, in the US, weed is like less than yeah. alcohol, right? It's like alcohol. It's like, that's so bad if you're drinking that when you're young. Mm. Whereas here, it's like alcohol, whatever. Alcohol is fine. Yeah. yeah. In Australia, it's like weed is like, oh my God, that's so bad. But... It just anyway, depends on so what I'm culture. just interested. Yeah, it's like how yeah. you perceive. But yeah, coke. <laughs> yeah, coke. Yeah, I think perceived quite badly. On... Cocaine's natural as well. It yes, goes through a process. <laughs> a quite bad process. <laughs> okay, uh, so when you okay, so you were like drinking, but so were you not drinking that much when you weren't like abusing alcohol when you're in the no? I was just, I was just, an, I was not really like when I'd go out, I'd drink, but if I didn't go out, I wouldn't drink. Um, but then I wanted to go out a lot because I felt like I had to make it like a lost time. And I just wanted to avoid the fucking pain of heartbreak and what I'd been through. Anyway, I got introduced cocaine. And like, fuck me, the first time I learned cocaine, I felt fucking incredible. All my problems just was like gone. And suddenly I was this confident lad that... I felt like I could talk to anyone. I felt like, I don't know, I just felt at ease. Like, it was weird. And I was so high, but it just felt like I was just brought back to life. That cocaine habit would escalate over a two and a half year period. Um, same, exactly the same situation. I was chasing that confidence. I was chasing my problems going away. But it would go from me trying it to me taking it every day of the week before work before or work during work after work would was it introduced to you at work or was it on a night out night out with work friends okay so you were doing it with people mm. at work and then I just could not deal with that like I mean I was a raving addict Oh my God, you know we were talking about James Smith before this. This is, I started playing around on Twitter Mm. and he retweeted one of my posts because I replied to, he's talking about coke, like, oh, if you want to stop your coke habit, just stop, stop drinking so much. And I was like, what about people who are doing it at work? Or I was like, this doesn't work when you're doing coke at 9am or something. And then he like retweeted me and was like, this is such a minor whatever. But I was like, yes, he reached me. <laughs> Good but, so, it, but yeah, so that wouldn't have helped you because it became disconnected from my, drinking. My alcohol's not my problem. Alcohol isn't my problem. Um, it would be one of the triggers that could lead to this, but cocaine for me was a way for me to be able to actually speak and not feel pain. It was like medicine. self medicating obviously but it was my medicine did it cause anxiety what the only time i really got ang- like yeah i couldn't sleep and whenever i went to bed i was anxious to fucking hell i hated it like i would and the next morning the first thing i'd do in the morning would i be i'd delete any memory from the night before which was really weird so i'd get it to get my confidence back but the confidence was false while i was on it so I would do things that were very out of character. Such as? Such as um, message every woman under the sun, call every woman. Um, if I couldn't get them, I would resort to even worse things with women. And... What do you mean? Like, I would like try and call for company as in like a sex worker um, not that I ever went through with it because I was scared shitless of them <laughs> but I would do anything to have company when I was so in the next morning what I'm saying is I had to go through all my fucking messages delete everything and block numbers 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 delete all my Google history because I was ashamed of what I was doing at like two in the morning. 
Okay, but it was driven by... Um... <laughs> because coke means that you can't really perform in that way. So oh yeah, no, you could, you definitely just, can't perform in that yeah. way. But, but so it was like you wanted physical like company. Yeah, you want you, it's like a first. So, it's like you've got the first, and I've, I'm, I'm sure most men that have taken cocaine know you've got the first, and you feel horny, but you also got the first for just wim- woman's company. And because I've probably taken far too much, I just want to chew their ear off for about two hours. But um, so you were like, "I'll pay a prostitute just to chat probably, to yeah. them." But... And I never, I never went through it. Thank God, God, that would that would hurt my mum. Um, it'd be another what? low point. Um, but I, that's not the worst thing in the world. No, Is I it? know, but my mum, like, I come from that family where that and because that's legal here right I, I I really don't know <laughs> a lot of the stuff I at the time I was doing wasn't legal so I the lines were very blurred okay but you felt like for you that was yeah not something you would you yeah. wanted to do no so I just had to delete shame from my life every single fucking day and after the breakup were you so you weren't like I need to find a new partner because now I'm behind, like, on my mission to get married and have kids or whatever. Or were were you just like, yeah, I'm free, like, I'm loving going. Um, I got involved with, obviously, the more I got involved in the cocaine scene, the more I'd be invited to parties. I actually, this is really out of character because I'm not very good at, like anyone that knows me I go to bed at about 9 o'clock in the evening and I do that on a Saturday and a Sunday and a Friday night as well I'm just not very good at staying up late but I'm now involved in this world of underground like raves Um, I'm taking a lot more than just cocaine it wasn't just cocaine I was taking but MDMA MDMA E Cat whatever was whatever was there I would take because I I really didn't give a shit about me I fucking hated me and did you enjoy the music scene or it was just let me be in an environment <laughs> where I can take lots of drugs? Yeah. I, I come from a rock and roll family. I'm now going to house parties that are playing like big bassy music and I'm like, I don't even fucking like this shit, but if I take this, I fucking like it. Yeah, but I feel like some of that music is like, you have to be, no one can enjoy yeah. it nah. so long. Um and were you with friends at this point or it was just random people in that scene? It was some random people in that scene and some friends. But my friends at the time, or them friends, were friends that I built up through the drug scene. Like through work, through drugs. And then I had an extension of that through partying. All throughout this period, like from day one, I wanted to kill myself. From day one of... Taking cocaine. Which is after the breakup. After the breakup, I wanted to die. When was the first time you remember that thought? First time I had a suicidal thought was when I was 16. 23, I had a suicidal thought every day till I was 26. That was just like... Just kill yourself. I've, just like, I'd walk up to a train station and I'd go, just walk out in front of that train. Would be going through my head. Is that what it was like at 16? At 16, it was more like, um, the world would be a much better place without me. You just felt worthless. Yeah. At 23, it was more like, when are you going to fucking do this? Like, please just hurry up and just do it. And then I'd take a bit more drugs and I could relieve that for a minute. Like, I could stop it just for a second. And how close did you get to making a plan at that point? Or did it just I didn't make a plan. I I tried to go through with a plan twice. I am... 
I tried to kill myself when I was 26. I, I remember it very clearly. It was the day after New Year's Day. I guaranteed my head, my plan was to have one more Christmas with mum and dad to tell them how much I love them. I've been planning it for a month. To tell them I love them. And then I, when Boxing Day come round, I was like, oh, I can't do it on Boxing Day. Like I'll get to New Year's Day. So I justified another exit strategy. And then it got to New Year's Day. And then it was meant to be going back into the work the day after. And I was like, I don't want to fucking live this life. So it's like, now's the time. So I went and got everything that I brought. I made a plan that I would leave. I was dating a girl. Bless her. Because she, uh, no one knew. I didn't express feeling. So I was dating this girl. Um, I, told, I walked out the door about five o'clock at night. I told my mum and dad I, I love them. Walked out the door. And I told them where I was going. So I said I was going to this girl's house. And that was a cover. So I went to this girl's house, stayed there for about an hour or two. And then I left that house. And I drove down the A2, which is from South East London to Kent Coast, with a two litre bottle of vodka in the wheel, just drinking the vodka. I had loads of fucking cocaine on me. I had loads of pills, tablets, everything. Um, and I said to myself, what I do, what I, my plan, I like to see, sea's therapeutic to me. Like it makes me feel at ease. And I thought the way I want to go is to be by the sea. So I drove down to this, my, a place. I don't even know where that place was. Or I remember it was like a couple of rows of houses. And then as you pull out the row of houses, there was like water and it was like beach. Um, like you're on the walkway before the the sand and the sea. I wrote a letter out, put it in a glove compartment and just started taking everything that I had in that car. It didn't fucking work. I woke up in the morning I, because whatever I was taking knocked me out. So loads of the stuff was just like next to me. I It just hadn't, like whatever I'd taken, it made me fall asleep. I don't know whether it's sleeping what tablets. Was it? Like I honestly, yeah, it must have been. Or something like that. I think it might have been diazepam, something like that. But I thought I was just getting, a, I was trying to make a human cocktail that would just make me like, implode. And I remember I got up and I was like, what the fuck have you tried to do? You've just tried to kill yourself. Like, this is really fucking bad, Dad. I was out of my head. I got back in the car. I was in the car. When you so, woke up? Yeah. Like was, a few hours later or something? Yeah. It's like seven in the morning. I was like, right, you you tried to kill yourself. Pull yourself together. you got to get home. It takes an hour and 20 minutes to get home. You can still get into work by quarter to nine. This was my plan. I'm driving in this car. This car, by the way, is a hire car because my car was actually in the garage. So I'm in this fucking hire car. I'm driving back up the motorway and as I was driving, the voices were talking like in my head and it's like, fucking hell, what are you doing, man? Just fucking kill yourself. Don't kill yourself. Just fucking kill yourself. Like, your mum, mum will want to see you. Don't do it, dad. It was like, it, there was a war. Anyway, he won. I sp- at the ra- uh, it was roundabout. I turned left and I was like, right, count to 10, take a deep breath. You're going to crash the car. And as I, I was at 10, 9, before I even got to bottom of 10 this is the funny bit of my story but I know it doesn't sound funny but the car ran out of petrol and it just stopped and it started rolling down the hill and I was like fuck's sake I can't even crash like I can't even kill myself properly here like I can't even do it so I parked up um, it was snowing I was on the news because I'd been missing for like basically I got out of that car that car was dead I got out of that car, I started walking across fields. I don't know where I was. And I was, and I basically was Wait, trying to get a lighter. On the news? Yeah, basically, I was missing three days and they put me on BBC local news. Wait, how has it gone three days by now? I did one day and then I did two, I did another night in the car and then basically I set off by foot. So you didn't go to work? No, because because I couldn't get because basically the car ran out of petrol, but I saw out my box. I weren't looking at petrol signals or anything. It was just this. I was in here so bad. 
Okay, so you started... Sorry, carry on. You got out of the car. Got out of the car. Um, I was sitting in the snow, which is a lot... Really, everything else is a bit of a blur. I remember getting a lighter. You know, like, the top of, like, a normal, like, clipper lighter is, like, ring of metal. And I tried to make that into a blade where I could cut myself. Um, anyway, I, I was so fucking cold. Like, I was, like, literally freezing. You would have still had lots of stuff in your system at this point as well. Yeah, so I was like, I was, I was walking like... Anyway, didn't work. I carried on walking, walking and walking. Um, the car was found 28 miles from where I was found. I was found in an industrial state called Sturry in Canterbury um, by a postman in the back of the bins. And I was. Do you remember you were like looking for warmth or something at that point? I was actually, I think the. I remember that night, but I was hallucinating. Um, I don't know whether it's because like hypothermia or what it was. I was seeing my dad, like my dad just kept talking to me like, "What have you done?" And and I just said this, and I can never work it out to this day because the next six weeks were really hard for me to, like. PTSD, like I've blacked out a lot of what happened after this. Um, so I, someone found, so you just passed out somewhere mm, and then someone found you. Someone found me. Apparently I told him that I had been mugged or I'd been beaten up. The police actually come and got me. And they was like, show me where you were mugged or beaten up. Apparently, this is like, I, I'm none the wiser now. And the and then they found out that it was obviously I attempted to take my own life when the story, because the story, I was lying to try and, like, so no one could know that I tried to do this. So you hadn't turned up for work and then they must have. Yeah. And then no one knew where you I, were. I think my mum realised first after 24 hours because I would ring my mum I ring my mum every day to this day like and I've done that all my life and I've always do that with my mum just to say hi just to say hi just go hi you alright mum like then she might go yeah all good any gossip over there and I'll go no gossip today mum and she'll be like okay then have a good day and I'll be like yeah you too mum that's about it sometimes it can be as quick as that Um, but just check in so my mum would have realised first and then she would have put the warning signal was out to everyone. And did they know what was going on? How unhappy you were, or how much you were? They knew crying? I had it. They knew I was. I I was in a dark. Not they knew I was in a dark place because that's wrong. They knew I was hanging around with the wrong crowd. So were worried about me. And were you just defensive about it? Yeah, I was an asshole about it. I haven't got a problem. Like, don't do need to worry. My brother even called me out one morning. And I was like, fuck off. Were you... Because I imagine you were just staying up till like... Yeah, no one would know. Yeah, no one would know. I was just... So you weren't living at home? Uh, yeah, at some time I was. Like, some of the time I wasn't there. At some of the time I was. But even when I was there, I'd wait for people to go to bed, everyone to go to bed. I'd take myself down into this room where no one could hear you. It was like a room at the front of the house that no one used. And I'd sit there on my own in the dark, just crack open a few beers and I'd just take gear and sit in the corner for two in the morning and what about when you were going out I'd go out and I'd do the same I'd, I'd actually leave in the final six months I'd leave nights out early like at 11 o'clock 12 o'clock because I wanted to be on my own and I'd rather drink on my own and take drugs on my own and be with my thoughts on my own because my thoughts were like so crippling and were you managing to get to work and everything Oh, God knows how, but yeah, I was. Like, I was work. I was trying to keep up... I was keeping up appearances. Did the people who you started doing drugs with at work, did they... Were they like, oh, it's, you've taken it too far? Or were they kind of... Similar? Everyone was involved. Like, everyone was in that scene. I think everyone knew I was... It was getting out of hand for me. But... Because we were all... Everyone was doing it around me. It's really hard to... Did management know it was an issue? I got called into management once to say, we think we saw you with white powder. Uh, not in work, at Christmas do. 
And I was like, no, I definitely didn't. No, didn't. You definitely did. <laughs> oh, no, they, I, I know what you've seen and you're definitely right on your suspicions, but you definitely didn't. And I just kept saying, no, you didn't. So you would do it like in the bathrooms at work? Yeah. 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 Just to get through. It was intense. Just coke? Yeah, just coke to get through the day. And then a bit more so alcohol. So you'd just be like mm. hyped up? Yeah. Alcohol for the night. Coke for the day. Okay, so then what happened after that? Um, I... Oh, or what was the first so was that the first attempt yeah that was the first attempt and then basically the second attempt where I ended up like quite bad I ended up in hospital um, and then I was sectioned under the mental health act Um, what does that mean basically it's I was labelled as a danger to myself and to others so I needed to be sectioned which means you stay in hospital yeah, in like a Facility. like if you would see it in the movies, like white padded <laughs> walls with a white padded uh, straight jacket. It wasn't like that. You do have to. I tell you one thing that you do have to do that you do see in the movies is like go and get your pills from a little like paper cup and then you tip them back. That's true. You do have to do that. So uh, how how long after was that? Five months. But. I had to tell. I had to lie to everyone. I was under observation for a long time because I was off work, obviously with depression, um, suicidal thoughts. I actually was sacked from work. Like, if I'm being radically honest, which I always am now, I stole from work to feed my cocaine habit, which isn't a surprise with the how fucking much I was using it. Um, so I lied to it. Basically. I was telling my mum and my parents, everyone around me, I was fine. I was getting better. I wasn't. From day one, I was saying to myself, as soon as I woke up, you wait till I'm free. I'm killing myself. So this was during... Wait, so during... After the snowing field incident, Mm -hmm. did you go back to work? No. 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 So you were sacked from work before that? Yeah. But wait, but then what were you gonna turn up to on New Year's? No, I was I wasn't sacked then. Like I was still in work then, but obviously, obviously once um, I had committed, tried to commit suicide. Um, out the wash started to come out of the wash. Like all my tracks, like everything that was been hiding started to come out of the wash. How did that happen? Like because there was money missing. Um, so and that had happened just before Christmas or something yeah yeah I, I was in, I was in bed with a lot of the wrong people and um, would they cover it would they in on it as well no 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 it was just me it was just me f- f- to be honest it was me just trying to f- fuel a habit that was stopping me from killing myself because I did not want to sit with my thoughts. Like, I cannot tell you how bad they were if I was, like, away from it. And then did you... Did they just say, we've found this out? Like, did you go and try no, and I, argue for yourself? No, I didn't. I knew what I'd done. And, and did they take it further and press charges or anything? Uh, no, I had a pension fund. Like, um, they took what I had got out of my pension which I don't know that to be honest I was so out of it at that time I was drugged up like the doctors had given me like really high fucking depression tablets and my mum was making me take them they just made me feel nothing like I was like just nothing going yeah. on and um, all of this stuff was happening I was getting letters every day from like banks or people chasing me for money because I weren't paying direct debits or anything like this I was just ignoring. I was so out of it. I couldn't tell you what was going on. Had you racked up credit card debt or anything? Mm. Wrapped up every single possible avenue. I'd paid a loan. I'd overdrafts. I'd credit cards. God knows. I reckon I was about thirty-five grand in a hole through coke. Maybe a bit more. Um, 
yeah that was just a chapter that I don't re I, to be honest I'm not really privy to because my mind was so consumed with suicidal thoughts at the time that I don't really remember all the little admin -y bits that were all the bits that were going on around I weren't even noticing how my family was I didn't know how my family was so did they be then become aware of the coke and all the debt and everything yeah they become aware they certainly become aware of the coke habit which was the hardest because suddenly you had to stop or did you manage to keep doing it during no, that time no no um, like what were you doing during that that little period yeah I was basically in my room they, I, was, I was so bad like I was like so depressed and, and I was drying out as well for the first two weeks where I was like literally I've been taking like three or four grams of coke a day and other drugs and alcohol for about a year straight like that level every day so literally the first two apparently first first week I don't even remember apparently I was asleep for the whole week and the second just like shakes and stuff like that but for the next two weeks I was literally drying out I felt like I was drying out and your mum was just watching you yeah by you. my side all the time and my cat Clyde God bless him. So that, so then how, okay. So that was kind of a good outcome with work then if they were just like, we'll take the money and then that's done. It didn't feel like that to me though, because it felt like, okay, that's a, that they, they, I, I, I felt so much shame for that because that's really out of my Just character. Doing. Yeah. What was it? Cash? Mm. There was like behind the... Yeah, it's just... I, I, I suppose I don't even know how I got away with it for very long, but yeah. Yeah, was, not great security in the yeah, bank. Yeah. <laughs> it's not their fault. I just, I've been working there for so long I just knew how to manipulate the system. Um, I wasn't unintelligent I just played to my advantages of being in the inside but yeah it's not part I look but I know that kid that was doing that at the time I look back at him with compassion and empathy now because he was just trying to make it through like he didn't realise what he was doing yeah you were feeding a habit that were, you were totally under the control of this yeah. addiction presumably yeah. and I'm guessing the bank saw it that way as well yeah, I'd, I've never again I've, whether it's I was protected by my mum or whatever I never really found out how that story so then did she get involved in like okay I, I, I think I got like a pack one day and I can't even remember what the pack and it just said this is the conclusion we've come to this is what we, this is the action we're taking Blah blah. I did briefly see it, and then that was like, it's done. And then what about the credit card debt? Um, I think I was declared. Um, what did I have? It weren't bankruptcy as bad as bankruptcy, but there's one just below bankruptcy. That basically they liquidise it, but then you have to still pay it back. But then it's like consolidated and then you have to pay it back over X but you get like a what was it a county court judgment against your name or whatever it is so I had that over my head and were you doing that or someone else was taking care of that because if you didn't care if you were like I honestly out. with that period of time when all this went on I could not fucking tell you what like the T's and C like I can't tell you who was signing who was ringing if I was ringing if I weren't ringing I I know that period. I know what it's like to me being in that period, but I just can't really recall like. Because ultimately you were like, I don't really care. I'm still going to end it. Yeah. But no one knew that. Everyone thought I was on the road to recovery. Um, then at 26, I just, when my mum finally released a bit of control and started to earn her trust, I went round to the shop 
got a load of bottles of alcohol, just put them in my bag. Then went, I think, to like three different chemists and tried to get like a box of tablets. And I think, I think it was like, I don't, the tablets were very varied. Like the one was codeine, something else, something else. Probably just an aspirin from like Tesco's as well because that's all I could get in Tesco's. But I would go around and see what I got. And I got a, like a good, um, a good amount, an amount that should see you off. Um, cause I'd done a lot of research on the internet about how much to take and that. And anyway, I just went up, boom, took them all in literally with this bottle of vodka. Before I know it, my granddad, I'm in my granddad's arms in a cold shower. And he just went, what have you done? You silly boy. And then I just blanked out and then I woke up in hospital, in hospital, like a day later. Um, everyone was around me. I had like drips coming out of me. I was like, "What?" The Where fuck? did your grandpa find you? My mum found me in bed. My granddad and my nan lived around the corner, and my mum was obviously hysterical because my dad worked in Central London. And he got the train in Central. He'd already at work. Called my granddad round because we we're waiting for an ambulance. They were waiting for an ambulance. Sorry. Um, called my granddad round to help with me. I was in bed. I was still breathing, but. I was like not here and my granddad apparently lifted me into this cold shower he's like he's, he's my hero my granddad like, he's a he's an amazing man um yeah I was going to say if cause do you have you learnt now a lot about suicide and suicide prevention and all this stuff because I, it's such a misunderstood thing, right? Like people, but there's one misconception that people think if, because I presume you are happy to be here now and that it didn't yeah. work, right? Yeah, yeah. so grateful. It, and this is what happens, right? People who go to end their life and then they're not successful usually or whatever there's all the data that it's like they go on it's like thank god that didn't happen and that's why suicide prevention stuff like on bridges and whatever really helps because people think like oh if someone's gonna suicide they'll just do it another way but that's not actually true like if you take away the means um but the point of me saying this is there is one thing that's dangerous is if you talk about how it can be done because if people if people don't know or yeah if you take away the means or if people don't know then you can actually save lives that way for example it's like happened with the ovens um mm. people used to put the head in up like sylvia mm. plath suicided that way and when they took town gas out of houses the suicide rates just dropped dramatically because it was like the way, yeah so it's not true that people will just find another way like they won't anyway so that's why it's like you shouldn't talk about methods of doing it and that's why that show 13 reasons why or whatever tv shows that like show yeah. how it's done is really dangerous because you're showing people a way that works but anyway you're talking about a way that doesn't work so it's like, apparently it's like, a lot of the um shot because I, I mixed it with like chemists which behind the till but shot a lot of them tablets that was taken had like safety mechanism like I don't, I'm not a safety mechanism I don't I'm not a doctor I don't understand but like a way that okay yeah. if you o- try to overdose it can't make you dramatically ill but I'm thinking I'm taking all these tablets because I've seen it in the movies mm. just like you said that's mm. how you've seen it like drink loads of shit do that mm. Or try and chuck yourself in front of a train because that's what we've seen. That's what we've seen in the movies. That's the way to do it. Mm. So I was looking again. I was probably looking for the easy way out. I like drink. I like drugs. Let me do a load of it and let me see if it can. It works. Mm. That was my mm. methodology, and it mm. didn't. Yeah. So don't but obviously, it, it. Yeah, that is how a lot of people have died, particularly mm. like high profile. Mm. Um, yeah. 
But but then and then I feel like people use that as a way to avoid talking about suicide as well. I don't know if you're like um, a Beachy or someone mm. it, where it's like, oh, he died like drug, you know, without being like mm, he wanted to end his life because you know people were too. Mm. That upset me. That documentary about him. I remember when. No, I remember when watching that, but I totally resonate with what you just said. Like he did want to kill himself. You can see, you can see his mask. Like it's just the way he presented himself. Like you could see it just was slowly deteriorating. That didn't happen by just I just took too many drugs or too much alcohol. It, there was no way. He wanted to kill himself. And I think with car accidents as well, people can be like, oh. Yeah, because I guess people are so uncomfortable with... So the drug over people are like, oh, it's like glamorised because, yeah, celebrity, you know, rock, rock stars and whatever. But, yeah. But it's, yeah, a more glamorous way to say, no, that person was miserable and wanted mm. to end their life. And same with like, oh, their car drove off the road and it's like, yeah, it, that was that's someone I know and it's kind of people are uncomfortable he was openly deeply depressed and it was like there's a reason the car went off mm. you know I think people really struggle with the word suicide like, full stop I just think there's so much stigma around it like is it only just recently the law has only just changed isn't it like suicide is like an it's, illegal like it's an act where it's well, that's why you they say to avoid saying commit. Yeah. Because then it's back when it was like a crime. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's reason because so they've can... tried to change it to, to like, you have to say, um, he tried to take his life. Yeah. That's what or I should say. suicided. Yeah. And I think that's fucking awful that we have to change these things. Like, I think it's so bad. Like. What do you mean? Because I just think suicide gets so much stigma like people struggle with the conversation because people it's like I speak I speak about suicide a lot with what I do because I want to normalize that conversation because it shouldn't be treated like a fucking swear word it's not a fucking swear word it's something that's real and media as you said mainstream narrative and media let's just call it a drug overdose not suicide because that sounds really fucking horrific like that's that's too bad like we need to change that for then people to be more open about saying I have a suicidal thought or I have experienced a suicidal thought instead of oh I've had that suicidal thought and then shaming yourself because you've had it like really normalise it I think there was a uh, there's a statistic that we all have a level of suicidal thoughts like in terms of wherever that is on the percentage scale mine was very up higher than the percentage scale and they look completely different. But if we can normalise that, normalise that every one of us will experience, you will have a thought one day that sometimes it might just be stupid. Oh, I wish I wasn't here today. Like, if we can normalise suicide or, or the word suicide, it would make people more forthcoming about, look, I've had a suicidal thought. Mm. Instead of making it look like it's a fucking crime scene or a criminal act. Yeah. So that's what that's why I had someone because yeah I talked about suicide in the first episode and someone said they've experienced that similar because I've had that thought you were describing when you were sixteen when it's like I'm worthless like mm. I don't want to be here like the world would be better yeah oh it's so emotional just to and say that, it. I find it like, hard yeah it's you're in such a bad place you feel mm. like you're such a failure. And that's why when people like about it being selfish, it's like actually the opposite of selfish because you think you're helping the world by not being there because you mm. think you're just, you know. Um, yeah, so that whole feeling, it's just like, I don't want to exist. And then someone else said like, yeah, I've had that. And I thought it would be helpful to have this suicide, this I used to work for this crisis... Uh, I volunteered for this crisis text line when people can text in. You know, like, maybe if you'd known about it at that point, you could... Because mm. people will be at the point where they're going to end it and they're reaching one thing of help. It's like, 
complete because even in those moments yeah as you were describing it's like one part of you was like no like don't do it I've heard the conversation I could hear it so vividly Mm. you can hear the two polar opposite forces working at play yeah and so yeah someone from that crisis text line to shout which I'll post the details for this as well if anyone needs to use it um he explained how it's like yeah the ladder up and yeah most people at some point in their life Uh because it's an option right if you're in a terrible situation if you're like seriously fucked up or something has gone so wrong yeah it's an option of like okay well i could just end it so it's like a lot Mm. of people will experience that thought in their life or i don't know i've heard different statistics on it but from the thought of I'm not, I'm worthless, like, I don't want to be here, to then, if I was going to do it, how would I do it? He explains, like, that's the ladder up, and that's what we take people through when they text in. It's like, are you thinking about this? And then how far along are you? Um, But I think giving people that education is helpful because some people will be so scared of the... word suicide and it's like oh my god if you're talking about it is this just gonna make like all these people so you know people just have these like crazy thoughts contagious yeah yeah but it's like actually someone wants help so when you remove the shame and yeah i i had that recently again i was in just got in this really bad play mine's all that caused by work and whatever just being like trapped in a situation where i'm working all the time can't Mm. sleep like can't function and it was just like i can't cope my body like shut down it was like i can't do this like i just need to that's the only way out Mm. and then when i started being like okay if you can tell that to people then you can start then people, first of all, then people can realise how bad it, because with, especially with depressed, people say that all the time, like, oh, depressed, I was depressed. It's like, what does that mean? Does it mean like you were just having a sad day? Or does it, you know, because I'm like, no, I'm depressed. I, I like, don't want to be here and I can't get out of bed because yeah. it's so, you know, that's very different to like, oh, like, I'm feeling a bit sad. It's so different. And... A lot of the work I do with men now, like it's normalizing all these fucking emotions. Because we say, some guys go to me, I'm depressed. Or is it, at, and then we work it back. And sometimes, no, you're just sad today. Just normalize being sad. It's okay to feel sad. Like it really is okay to feel sad or frustrated or weak. It's okay to feel that. but. Men are so scared to talk about those feelings that they would rather just, well, they are taught by society really. Go get, go to your GP, get a tablet. They tell you you're depressed. Actually, sometimes it's just a, they need to express an emotion of some sort that they've kept under. And what I did, I kept every single emotion under the lid, and it, I was just a boiling point of emotions I use the analogy imagine me like a bin like you keep filling the bin eventually it's going to spill out into the world that's what happened with me and that's what happens with emotion the longer you store it you're going to spill out into the world like depression I've known so many people with actually severe fucking depression and it is it literally castrates you and you cannot do anything. You don't want to do anything, but you are literally bed bound. Like you have got nothing in you. And I know what that feels like. It's fucking horrible. Mm. But I guess the other thing is you can hide it as well sometimes and people don't. Yeah, you can't see it from the outside because you can still kind of function. And mm. yeah, I was thinking when we we're saying about the different levels of thoughts, I remember this another friend at work who was like so hating it so much and she was like sometimes I just like wish I got hit by a car and that's like similar like I don't think she was talking about on a point that it would kill her but it's like that's the same it's like you are so stuck in your situation that you're you want harm to come to you for in some way to like 
get relief from. Relief from the pain, yeah. Relief from your mind for a moment. But you don't necessarily... That required, like, a deep level of trust for her to say that to me. Do you know Mm. what I mean? And it's like a lot of the time you can be stuck in a place where, yeah, you just can't tell anyone. Like, when I I was studying at Cambridge and I I was really... Got into a really depressed period in that point, but I was in all these roles like student leadership stuff, mm. and people, and I was just couldn't tell any. I didn't tell anyone who I was studying with. Obviously, like my boyfriend at the time knew, and yeah, but he, but I was told like by someone that I don't understand how hard it is for people, and have I ever heard of depression? And some people are like, is in this guy who was like complaining about lockdown bullshit and like us not being you know and was like Mm. telling me that I don't like I don't understand something about mental and it was like I'm like so depressed I'm thinking I like can't even think about going on and but it was like it's so hard because you know then people use it as like a victim a a weapon yeah be like We've got released a judgment, like completely judgment free from what everyone is experiencing. My version of depression as the experiencer of my version of depression will have varying levels to your experience of depression. We could still have depression, but be at various levels of that or experiencing it slightly differently. Same with anxiety. I was speaking to a good friend of mine. I experience if I got bad anxiety, I feel like it's like a cobra, like in my heart space, like a, it really attaches me to like a vice, and I will cry throughout the whole experience. My my actual friend, he's physically sick, and he feels it in his stomach or his feet. So just like depression, no one can, no one should be using that as a fucking weapon to put that down because you do not understand what no one understands the experiences version or the experiences version of suicidal thoughts is completely different to my version of suicidal thoughts and then so how did you come out of this and can you talk about the work you're doing now as well yeah um 10 years of bloody hard graft is how I came out of it. Um, I was left with no choice but to make a change. I wanted to make a change. I made a choice the first day I was in my new uh, ensuite home in uh, this mental health facility. Um, no, I was staring at the ceiling. And I was like, I need to change. I'm not putting anyone through this anymore. And so you were like, I don't. I don't, don't want to. No, I end. I can't do this anymore. Like I can't I can't lie to anyone anymore. I'm gonna come clean, and this is when I came clean, and that really was the fucking turning point. It was like I spoke for the first time about how I felt. Didn't speak about everything, but I said that this is what I'm experiencing. I was truthful. With it. To your family or to family to doctors like I had no choice it was either I do that or I will fucking die there, there's no like it's now or never like you keep acting like this I'm abusing my body and I went on a journey of 10 years of self discovery working with counsellors therapists breath work gurus meditative gurus I've been working with different coaches of various levels multiple therapists like I just learnt to understand myself. Like, really fucking understand myself. Really understand what limiting beliefs that I had from a childhood, what patterns were playing out now, what behaviours were affected from where, and just really understood that and not label myself as a victim anymore. Because all the time up there, I thought life was happening against me. Rather than the way I view it now, if anything bad comes along, it's like, Here's a lesson. This this bad shit that's about to go down, there's definitely going to be a lesson in here. Like, it's whether I choose to perceive it as a lesson or negatively. Can I just run to the <laughs> Go on. Yeah. I need to know as well. What's Can the time? Yeah. Oh, but I want to keep talking. Uh, oh my God, it's 20 to 6.
take you. I'll take you for a wee in a bit. No, I've got one. If I miss my train, will I be able to use my ticket on a later one? What time's your train? In like I've five got, minutes. Oh god, yeah, you will be able to. What time's the next one? The, oh, there's plenty more trains. All oh, right, yeah, you'll be fine. <laughs> you'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay. So then. How did you start doing the work? So you're doing all this work on yourself. You started working again. Uh, yes, yeah, so I started doing all this work on myself. And when I was working with, especially within counselling and therapy, it was very heavily represented by females. And there was not a lot of male representation. I couldn't find, for ages I couldn't find a male therapist and I really needed a male therapist to trust. I felt like I could trust another male if he slightly understood what it was like to be a man and to go through the experience that I had gone through. And it was during that time that I made a decision that I wanted to go into the mental well-being space but I didn't want to go into it as therapy or counselling because my most beneficial periods of self-development are when I worked with um, I worked with a couple of coaches and one of the coaches that I worked with um, he's not got an online presence he was just like a guy that I got given his name and told to work with him a guy called Matt he was fucking amazing for me. He's like, very, like very different. He'd done a lot of mindset stuff, but done a lot of healing in the present. To where therapy and counselling would go past, past traumas and stuff like that. He brought it all into the present day, and then made me heal from the present. And he got exactly what I went through. He understood about addiction about suicidal thoughts, about what it's like to be bullied, about, and I was just like, there's just not enough. There's not enough of an online presence talking about these difficult subjects. I think there's more now than there ever has been, and there's more being done. Um, but I wanted to use my story to help me, to help um, raise awareness, and help men be able to have someone they can work with if they're interested in self-development that could, they can relate to. 
at what point in the journey, in your recovery journey, did you decide you want to help other people? Six years in. So, uh, so, 26, 26, 10 years. So, yeah, this has been a four year journey to get to being um, a coach um, and creating the brand that is going to be called, which is called Proudly Me. Because the reason behind the title Proudly Me is because all I ever wanted to do was just be proud of who I am. And for so long, I went. I hated on myself and I know so many men just want to be someone different or something different and I just want to create men or help as many men be proud of actually their own unique gifts their own definition of success their own identity I want them to be proud of that person that they stare back in the mirror not shamed hated on or because us men all the men that I work with they hate on themselves more than the outside world hate on them but they their perception of the outside world is everyone won't like them for who they are so that's why I did um, and that's why I'm working in this space and at what point did you because I presume you got to the point on your healing recovery journey where mm. you were like actually there's this whole other thing I can access like within myself within the world and like I can be better than just you know better than just oh okay I'm a normal person who works in a bank like that you're like oh my god there's so much more that life yeah. can offer um 31 31 was the age. I got given a book by Oprah Winfrey. And I remember reading this book. I went through another breakup. It wasn't bad. It was just a normal way of relationship ending. It weren't a great, great way to end the relationship. But not many relationships end in a bed of roses. Um, but it was just the end of its relationship journey. And I met a random person that was in my life for about two weeks. And their parting gift in my in my life was they gave me a book and it was called What I Know For Sure by Oprah Winfrey. I read this book and I don't know why, it was like suddenly a light switched on my head. Like it was just, it's like fucking hell, Oprah is a fucking goddess. Like Jesus Christ, what have I just read? And... I've never read the book again. It's actually, the, the, I bring my books wherever I go. It's in the shelf there. Um, and I don't even know what it said, but it, it lit something up in me that knew that we always experience pain. That you can't get away from the pain that you experience. We are human. We are going to experience. But you can access better life and better quality of mental wealth if you constantly strive to do the work on yourself you constantly strive to be better and to be of service and for them reasons I've changed me completely cool And what, okay, so you help men, you, I think your tagline says like in hyper-masculine environments. And I sent a screen, cause I messaged my friend who's half, his mom's English. Well, when I was on the train over down here, cause I was like, this is so random. I'm going for a cold water swim by the seaside <laughs> and then meeting this person who I know nothing about, uh, but here's his Instagram. And he was like, what a hyper sense what a hyper masculine environment in Eng- like taking the piss out of English people being like there's no such thing because you're all weak or something <laughs> anyway um <laughs> that's the definition of a hyper masculine man um yeah hyper masculine environments uh that and I do need to reword that I have to admit because people do ask well, what does that I mean I straight away thought like a construction site or something yes they are traditionally 
places of um, a larger male population, which hyper masculine environments look like football, uh, rugby, any sport really, um, construction, um, school, like all boys schools, like uh, with, with men. And that hyper masculine environment is where it borderlines toxic, but it's where hyper masculine, it, to be a hyper masculine male is to be strong, be athletic, show emotional control, them environments. And that is where um, a lot of obsession for males is born from. And if they can't live up to the obsession of being X, which is athletic, popular, good looking, um, good at sport, um, doesn't... Or Pat, I always, whenever people are like good looking, I'm like... What about like someone like Boris Johnson who gets so many women and her? It's, like, <laughs> some, it's like power in yeah. that. Yeah. Some kind, some kind of thing. Oh, someone like Putin, someone who knows how to climb a hierarchy, I guess. Yeah. And that, that, that's what all us men, uh, a lot of us men, try to do. But because we're born from that hyper-masculine environment, we resort to violence. And violence is our way that we get up the scale. But violence can be, I'm not talking about in Putin's terms, but violence can be just like demonstrating how fucking strong you are. Like, because you think that will get you higher through the food chain. Or violence could be, show strength by not showing any fucking weakness. Uh, what's, what does weakness look like to most men being vulnerable and actually vulnerability is where courage is a vulnerability is where actual courage is born a like true courage is because you can't control the outcome to be seen but you create trust empathy um creativeness innovation you're able to obtain feedback it's where all the beauty in the world is to be vulnerable but us men in hyper masculine environments are taught completely the fucking opposite. Hmm. Yeah. And I guess it's it's like authenticity. Yeah, when you're just being on, you know, now you here being completely honest, that's like you're stronger than ever, right? Because you're fully who you are. I don't feel I used to shame myself so much um, for being for being that person that wasn't me like I used to shame the shit out of myself and because I I don't, I don't know what that definition in, in its entirety of success was but I could never get there so because I couldn't ever get to that peak of the apex hyper masculine fucking chain because I couldn't ever get to that top of that point I would shame myself for not being that I'm not good enough I'm worthless I am fucking shit at this what is the point now that I've stepped into my authentic version um, of self have no shame like yeah I've, I've made a lot of mistakes in my past but I acknowledge them and I can show myself a lot of empathy for them because th that person did not know any better he did it I remember being like 23 at the time when you when you first having suicidal thoughts and I remember saying that I was stressed once and I think I may need some support to uh, someone at work I remember ringing up saying I was stressed I got laughed at and told me you're just doing it for a day off. So um, to be mentally, to be me now, I have to allow myself to be vulnerable with everyone, even if, uh, if even if that other person could potentially say, you're just being weak. Okay, well if I'm weak then I'll take this version of weakness any day. This is my version of courage, just by sharing. Yeah, and it is, I mean, I think especially about what you experienced with that 
domestic violence to speak about that mm. is so courageous. Um, because, yeah, I know that happens and that, but it's not often spoken about because it's so hard to, mm. you know, to say I was beaten up, you know, by a girl, or whatever. You know, it's like this, but it's seriously messed up. And the fact that you're doing it is so like, it's just so brave and it's amazing. Thank you. And I hope, I really hope you don't feel shame about any of like, and if you've managed to work through all this stuff and get rid of any shame, like that's just amazing. And I think so inspiring. It's con- uh, as I've always say to every client that I work with, it's constant work. You may experience something new tomorrow that will make, might make you question a few things or you may feel shame. And it's about just being radically honest in that moment and working on that point right there and then. You're constantly going to be working on yourself. But if you do that, you become the best version of yourself or the best version you can ever be. And that's beautiful. Mm. And it gets easier. I mean, because it's like life, it's problems, right? It's always... You're always going to have them. You can't can't get away from them. But even good problems, you know, like if you're in a relationship for 10 years and it's a really great relationship, but then you're like, we have a problem of what's a new fun activity to do. You know, that's like a version of... I think that's from subtle art of not giving a fuck I don't know if you've that <laughs> but it's like choosing the problems you want to have and it's like okay I want a good relationship this is the problems that come with that exactly and the, the, everything takes constant work everything it's just a just choose your vice mm. but where you're having it I choose every one of my problems and I will continue to choose all the problems that I have because I make it a product of my environment. I know the work that I'm in, so I know the problems that are going to come with that work. And yes, they are going to be stressful at times. I know the problems that are going to come with a healthy relationship. Um, I have to be radically honest in that and express how I feel. I can't be seen to suppress it. So it's all important. I choose them problems. And so do you find... Okay, wait. So was it scary talking about this on social media? For the first time, which is how we started this. I would fucking shit myself. Yeah, I was shitting myself. I, I'll tell you one thing. When I first posted on social media about suicide, this is my story. Just give me like a five minute clip. Um, I remember I posted it onto Instagram. I didn't have social media for a couple of years because it was. It weren't doing no well for my mental health. I just wanted to prove to that I could come away from my phone and not rely on social media. Um, I posted it. I ran out the house, um, left my phone indoors, and I went out for four hours before I came back to my phone because I was so fucking worried. Like this was an opportunity for me to now step up and speak my truth and talk about what I went through and not and not. Not normalise it, because we can never normalise it, but at least release some st- shame and stigma around it. I remember I got back and the feedback was amazing. I was like, and it was only like a probably a few people and my mum and um, that my brother saying, you're really brave, mate, for doing that. Like, I didn't need to run. I just needed to allow myself to be vulnerable. So was your mum trying to protect you? As in, like, yeah. are you sure you want to talk about this? Yeah, because you knew that it could be repercut. Like, they could, or with anything I talk about, especially drugs and uh, and those challenging conversations, there could be other people's perceptions. I've received some bad criticism on TikTok for the outfit I wore <laughs> one of one of my posts, and it really hurt me because I never experienced a bad comment before like um, what like i hate your uh, clothes yeah yeah he said um what did he say before you go and post anything on social media make sure you iron your fucking t-shirt and stop wearing cheap shorts and i was like you cheeky bugger i got these from reese 
<laughs> and Reese is a fucking good shot, but this is a good t-shirt. And I'm like, you cheeky bastard. That really hurt me. But when I was talking about drugs, like, and I tried to talk about it on TikTok, I had a post that just blew up and it scared the shit out of me. But so many comments. Is this the 2.4? Yeah. Movies? This is crazy. This is Instagram versus TikTok, right? That shows the difference. Uh, uh, where I've gone from no followers to suddenly waking up having like 5,000. And I was like, what the fuck's going on? But I'm getting these comments on the videos and they're brutal on TikTok. Like, they don't give a fuck. Like, I'm... What are they saying? Shall I tell you? Uh, it would take me a while. But they... To find it. But it was like... Um, and they do filter some, so you could, but you can look at the filtered comments. Fuck me. What they filter the abusive ones. Some of the abusive, so some of them, not all of them, get through the net, but then some of them do. Like, um, just laughing about how I looked. Um, need to go. He needs to go and sort this out. He needs to go and sort that out. And I'm thinking, fucking hell, I'm talking about mental health and help and trying to like raise awareness and people are trying to damn the person that's actually trying to have these radically honest conversations what do you think's going on with the people who are writing that they're really struggling and it's too much for them to yeah it's probably it's projection isn't it in some shape or form but i've I've taught myself i can't be criticized i can't allow criticism to get to me if that person ain't willing to step in the arena either. Because real vulnerability is you're stepping into the arena. So if I'm criticising you, it's okay. Yeah, because you're in the arena with me. Like, and I can un- I can accept that. I can accept because you have the courage to be seen. Mm. But if you're not going to share your truth and be vulnerable and have radical, honest conversations or present to me with your amazing dream or idea... Then I don't give a fuck mm. what you think of me. Like this is not for you. Then my this bit of content will be for someone, but it ain't mm-hmm. for you. So you don't let it affect you too much. Not now. But when it when it first, obviously, it was all new to me, and I had to navigate that. But I realised my message is to. I won't stop being vulnerable, and I won't let anyone deter me from it. If I do get any negative. I've just got her, um, I, I've taught myself to ignore it now, not look at anything, because it's, yeah, you the have point? the girl managing your social media, <laughs> <laughs> look, you do it, dream, <laughs> she does the posts and replies for me, because I can't, I can't look at it, it just, that's why, mm-hmm. It's brutal. Like TikTok and Instagram, they they can be places that are quite brutal. I got a comment on one of my Instagram posts the other day, saying your friends are weird. Look, this random guy has just come on my Instagram to comment, your friends are weird. But he's that's an odd thing to do. What he's doing, I, so I, I know, and I'm like, like, I can't let these affect. Because they get these people are getting a kick out of it in some shape or form. So hopefully you can stay connected to your mission, which is to help other men, and you're yeah. doing the social media stuff to help your business, which is helping other people. Mm. And so as long as the people are still getting something out of it, as long as if anyone can take anything away, if I could raise one bit of awareness. Or touch one person's life in terms of they are experiencing a similar type of issue or experience a similar type of issue. Or have got some like-minded stuff in uh, in terms of our story. Then if it's just one person, then I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing fucking more than good. Like, that's one person that I've helped. And whether that would be with me directly working with them or just a bit of content, I just want to add value wherever I can. And this, we can, it's been over two hours, so we can wrap up in a minute. Even though it's like, oh my God, yeah. I could just keep talking. Um, the men who find, who seek you out, mm. what kind of things are usually going on for them? It's, it's really varied. 
It's really, really varied. Um, it can be from, it can be from, I am not ever, I do not want to be a therapist or cancer. I don't want to go through past wounds all the time. I want to bring some of the past to the present and see how we can believe, reframe it, learn, learn the positive from that. Uh, or reteach the brain to focus on the positive or in the body. The men that I usually work with tend to be either after addiction to after you've conquered addiction or conquered it. You're always an they always say you're always an addict. I don't feel like I've got that label anymore. Um, and I say that from a really empowering place because I do don't feel like I'm controlled anymore by it, which I know some people can be. But they're usually the people that have recovered, still label themselves an addict, and don't see how they, how do you have fucking fun in life again, or how is life meant to be good after I've overcome, it feels like this big void again. I help them reconnect with their internal world. Um, and it, that that's what, that's, I suppose, my gift. I help men reconnect with their inner world, re-identify with, the very, 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 very first version of self that come through into this world as high self-esteem, high, high self-love, self-compassion, until it all got watered and milked down. So it's those types of people that are either struggling in that or struggling in relationships. I get a lot of people with relationships. And what kind of thing would you do in these workshops you were? that you're running at this amazing cafe. cafe. <laughs> I, I haven't to. started yet and I haven't planned the first one, but I want to do it around a theme or an emotion every week. The reason I'm going to do it around like an emotion every week is because men traditionally suppress or don't experience 70% of emotion. To 70% of the human experience us men ain't fucking experiencing because we won't allow ourselves to experience it because deemed being weak. So I really want to talk it to on an emotional level and why it's normalise that and show the positives in every emotion. Even good emotions, I feel like, with... Joy. Men, if you like ask excite, men... Like, yeah. Childlike excitement is... Is it frowned upon? You're not allowed to get too excited. Like sending, ex yeah. putting an exclamation mark in an email. It's like, it has to be serious. Yeah, it's like joy. They they say men really struggle to experience pure joy. Joy, fuck's sake, joy. We, we're like denying ourselves that emotion. It's just like getting what I like to say to people. I'm gonna get you out your own fucking way. Because it's like either coming from like a wounded ego and in a child or um, or just some trauma that you've experienced that's really fucking normal. And do you find a most of your clients or like people who'd come to a group thing past the point of like, oh, I feel like there's shame around seeking help? Ninety percent of the time it's really hard to get them on the initial call. Like the initial, I want to meet all my clients. I meet all my clients before we even start work or look to working with. I want to have an hour and a half chat with you. I want to really go through everything. That call is usually the hardest bit to have because there is like, oh my God, do I look weak? Do I look like I've got that label on me or whatever for taking that call? That's the hardest bit. And men struggle with taking that first step. But what, okay, so they've started messaging you, but then it's like, oh. It will go, it will go, it will go rocky. Cause it's like, oh my God, I've got an action now. I've actually got to do this. I'm going to do some mental health work, which has still got so much stigma if we say mental health, hasn't it? The word's so fucking loaded. Like, I, I always say, I think we need to rebrand mental health to make it sound a bit more empowering, like the gym is for fitness. Do you know what I mean? But it is. It That's what, oh, that's what I hate. That's what triggers me about this mm. with these getting help. Because, yeah, initially it's like, whatever, I had to 
medication and like therapy and whatever but then it became the point of like oh my god my life's getting so much (laughs) like I'm like going way above like what I was before and this is awesome and like it's not like help because I'm not okay it's like I want to get read these books and like meditate Mm. and like look after myself and I'm like to the people who are like quote unquote normal and who were like looking at you like you're weird okay this is like clearly very specific like people in my life (laughs) but it's like it's like oh you need to do this because you're like not living life fully and you're judging me for wanting to do all this work that you think is weird but you would get so much out of it but then I feel like for those people they can label you as like there's something wrong with you or like mental health where it's like you have mental health as well and like we've just got to relabel it all Mm. i don't know as i said yeah i don't know what it would be called but we've got we've got to normalize it so much like the gym is for fitness like your diet is for your waistline like Mm. all of those are celebrated if you go and take those actions sometimes if you take talk about i'm going to seek a therapist the first reaction is what the fuck is wrong with you no there's nothing wrong with me i'm just I'm going to talk about my shit so I can be even better tomorrow. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to be so much fucking better tomorrow. And I think it is like that in some places. I don't know if for men as well, but apparently in Brazil, it's like that. It's like so normal to, it's like everyone has a therapist. It's It's like like having having a a physiotherapy therapist or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's part of your team, part of your, and that's what I'm big on, like having a team around me and I have my mentor and, he has his mentor and like I always surround myself with people that I can ask for help. Great. Mm. Okay, one more random question. How do you feel about society, this like view of that men are bad and the cause of all the problems in society? <laughs> uh, it's ridiculous. Do you know, I, I, I was reading a stat the other day in relationships and relationships um, ending in affairs 80% of it is females actually initiating the the affair and actually leave like it's something around like 80% of the women that leave are the ones that actually have the affair out of a marriage and I'm like men TV shows everything I think it's more even look there's always going to be issues is it going to be a balanced perspective I think male and female can be as good and as bad as each other. We all have real huge good in us and we also have a dark side. We all have a dark side. Let's fucking normalise the shit that we all have a dark side. But on like your TV, on TVs, on the fucking news, on your movies, everything, the bad guy in any rom- romance film is always the man. And... It, there's like a stigma and especially it's just like a stigma there's like a label put on men are the root of all evil and that just ain't the fucking case I, I think we're all 50-50 in this I all think we're positive and good yeah well I guess it's like the systems you're describing that then maybe create violence and oppression or whatever it's the a small group of men who then figure out how to get to the top and then oppress, you know, like Putin, yeah. for example. Those people, the very, very bad people, are usually always men. But it's not to say that all men are like... It's like men are victims of these systems yeah. as well as women. Yeah, And then maybe people confuse that with then labelling all men... And then when you're labelled with that, then men do tend to pay, make more poor choices off the back of that, which would, they would meet their label. They would match their label. Because that's what we tend to do. Like, when we try to fit in, we are going to meet a label that we believe that we've been attached to. So, if that's bad, fuck it, I'll be bad. And that's when we get involved with everything that doesn't serve us. So is it really, is, do you get a lot of fulfillment from seeing like the progress men make? Oh, through? It makes, I cannot explain it, 
I thought I'd get... I never... I can't... If I could bottle up the feeling and take it away... To just see someone just grow that... Inch... There's no other feeling like it. It's like... I am there to hold space for someone. Not there to... Make... Give them a magic potion and... Like... Magically grow... I'm there to hold space for someone and I'm a firm believer in in your awareness before it became very narrowed um, you knew the answers I'm just going to help you fucking unlock them again so just to see someone grow um, I'm in a very blessed position and that's magic for me that's enough magic I don't need any more a few, well, my dog, but apart from that. <laughs> Has anything ever not worked out when someone's like, this is too, there's too much shame or there's... Yeah, it can be, because we, we, I'll go there with people. I'll go there, I'll talk about vulnerability, I'll talk about shame, I'll talk about guilt. This is a lot of the stuff that I talk about is the key subjects that of, of my work. It's releasing that shit. Sometimes there's too much comfort in the pain and people really ain't ready to let go of that comfort. Because going into a new version of self or uh, what I like to call your 2.0 version of self, it's fucking scary because you don't know the outcome. Oh, so people want to stay being a victim. Yeah. Because there's comfort there. They know it, they feel it. They know what his surroundings are like. They know the box that it's in. So they're okay being there. Or they think they're okay because it's, as it's the old saying, comfort in pain. Um, and new beginnings, new horizons require you to be vulnerable because you ain't got control of the outcome. But new, I'm telling you, anyone that... <laughs> You stay in victim mode and you can stay there for as long as you want. I could have stayed there for the rest of my life. This all happened to me. Now, I look back at it and went, that all happened for me. And there's a huge difference in that. Yeah, and I think that's amazing what... I guess that's what I'm trying to do by putting these conversations into the world that people can listen to you and it's clear that point in your life when you made the choice to mm. say, I'm going to take accountability and I'm going to get better. Yeah. And it's my decision. And then you have to let go of that victim narrative. And now, yeah, it's like everything you're doing and speaking and everything, it's like you're in control of your life and what you're doing. And I think that's where the strength comes from, right? Absolutely. I could not agree more with you. Okay. Last three questions that I ask everyone. What... Is there a book that's had the most impact on your life? Is it that Oprah book? The Oprah book had a really um, big impact on my earlier years in self-development um, but I suppose the book that I learnt the most from is The Power of Now and to really be present like not allow yourself to live in the future or past that I can't talk. yeah that changed me a lot you're the second person to say that that book on this oh, I'm a, it's amazing his other book How to massive impact on me a new stillness earth. a new earth a new earth I it's really good you should read it um okay second question what do you have a mindfulness or meditation practice do what? I do one yeah daily daily um first thing as I get up Minimum, it changes, it varies day to day, but I'm, um, silence is the biggest gift that you can give yourself, but 
and silence is such a beautiful thing that you can give yourself but I understand it's really hard to sit in silence when you've never allowed yourself to sit there before but it will help you so fucking much to just be super super clear super aware of what's going on in you internally like really look under it's just like looking under underneath a car bonnet and that is what meditation gives you to see what's going on on the underneath so what do you do what's your practice like um i practice for 20 minutes today i do i have i, I take my clients through meditation a lot um 20 minutes in the morning is just like non-negotiable for me. That would just be usually sitting in silence. I take myself out of bed, put myself in a nice spot, and I actually will sit in silence and do my breath practice, which is usually four inhalation, six exhalation, and I'll just repeat that until I can't. Through your nose. Through my nose. But I do a lot of um, breath work as well. So my practices can change. And at the moment, I'm learning how to regulate my nervous system through state. And that's how I can regulate, because you have three different types of states, like connection, activation, deactivation. Connection is where you feel you're fucking most amazing. I'm trying to teach my nervous system at the moment how to, I can move through every single state and still bring myself back to connection which is your green, like deactivations when you're like more depressed, suicidal, and activations when you're a bit stressed. So I'm teaching my nervous system at the moment. So my practice looks a bit different at the moment because I'm taking myself um, in and out of states and just trying to teach my nervous system how to respond when, in, when I'm faced with problems that I can regulate it properly to bring it always back to connection. Okay, I will get stressed, but I can bring it back quicker to connection and get that warm, fuzzy, happy feeling. Do you meditate here? Uh, I meditate fucking anywhere I fancy in the morning, really. I do it wherever I fancy. So this morning was in that corner of my sofa behind. Sometimes I just like the feeling of a wall, like sitting with my back against the wall on a cold floor. Yeah, because I'm just thinking, I've just started this practice of getting sunlight into my eyes because apparently, like, with window open, like, direct. Yeah. Or even, I mean, it's cloudy most of the time. We're in England. <laughs> yeah. That, whatever, the hormones are, anyway, that's the whole thing. But I'm just thinking that this room we're recording from, it's like all these windows looking out onto the ocean. We want to make it into like a breathwork space. And the sun ri would rise over there, right? Uh, no. Oh. It's directly that way. You get the sunset when it's more summer, when it's a bit higher, directly into the ocean over that way. Nice. But yeah, I mean, still amazing place yeah. to wake up and meditate. Okay, last question is what three words describe the best version of yourself or the version you want to show up as? Vulnerable. Patient. Compassionate. Great. Thank Is you. there anything else you want to say? Do you want to give your how people find you or... Uh, you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, or LinkedIn. It's all under Daniel Constable at I Am Proudly Me. Thank you so much. Thanks.